Swinburne University of Technology. Welcome everyone to, to the first lecture which is topic one, you'll, you'll find this under, under the learning materials. Um, I suppose this is a lecture by, by any other name. Um, what I'll be doing is, is running you through the basic concepts that are involved in um, this, this first topic, well in each of the topics. In this first topic what, what we're dealing with um, in this topic is the sociological gaze. Um, you'll see the topic one is sociological gaze, perspective, imagination. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. All of those, are, it's a, the three terms are interchangeable. I've, I've included the three terms um, so that in case different different authors will use the the different descriptors: gaze, imagination, or, or perspective. Perspective, maybe less so, but certainly gaze and imagination are used quite a bit. Uh, so I want you to understand that they're interchangeable. The other thing about the lectures is that, that normally when you, um, uh, when you go to a lecture there'll be a set of PowerPoints behind the lecturer. Um, I'm not all that keen on PowerPoints but we're compelled to use and we're compelled, well we're not compelled really by the university but we're compelled, compelled by convention to use them because people like to see something written, written above the lecturer. A PowerPoint is simply a guide to what, you, what is going to be talked about. They're not discursive, that means they don't go, go on um, and give you detailed content, they're just pointers, they're markers to say we're at this point and between this point and the next point there's going to be a whole lot of stuff but that whole lot of stuff's going to come out of here, it's not going to be there. Apropos of that, um, I understand that people like something, so with apologies to Bob Dylan, here is the PowerPoint. Can is this work? Fantastic. So let's get rid of this ugly yellow thing. No, I can't get rid of the ugly yellow thing. So these will be my PowerPoints today. So what we're starting off is we're starting with the the sociological gaze, the sociological imagination, and and this is what I what I was hinting about in the first. Uh, in, in the introductory stuff that, that I did for you is that there's a perspective, a way of seeing the world that's, that's particularly sociological. It's, it's sociological in the sense that it's, it's looking at, at how we conceptualise the world, we as sociologists conceptualise the world, but beyond that it's a, it's a critical engagement with how the world works. Lots of people do it um, what, what I would argue from a sociological point of view is, is we do it from an intellectual basis and from a basis that's detached, if you like. It's, it's, it's not driving a, a particular point or a particular position, but what it is, is the sociological gaze or the sociological imagination is unpicking um, the way society works um, in a way that's most useful to understanding what's behind uh, social phenomena or social events. Um, this is what, what we call a, a methodology for understanding human society and culture. Um, a methodology is an approach to, to gathering information. So if, um, if for instance, you're, you're coming across something, something in the media about, say, no, about politics, about about what's happening, say in 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 Europe at the moment, um, in relation to their crisis, or what's happening in in the Arab world in relation to the the Arab Spring. Um, there will be a number of different ways that we could look at it. We could look at it from an ethnocentric, um, racist point of view, and and just dismiss it as as mad Arabs killing themselves. And there will be a discourse in. Uh, right-wing radio that probably you'd be more familiar with in Sydney than anywhere else that would would present their analysis in that term. Um, there would be more intellectual analysis that you would hear in in the better media looking at, at the, the the issues in the background and the various um, factions um, that that may explain why why groups are uh, uh, 
having problems with each other, in fact killing each other. There might be another more international analysis that looks at the interests of the West and why the West may not be all that interested in making sure Syria sorts out the problems because Syria is a useful tool for the West um, and Western interests. There may be an analysis from um, the Palestinians that see it a different way. There may be analysis from the Iranians. There may be an analysis from Europe. There may be more, uh, more personal analysis um, in relation to the particular sub-ethnic stroke class group um, that, the Syrian, that constitutes the Syrian army. There are lots of different ways of seeing social issues um, that the sociological imagination encourages you to unpick. So the idea, the, the methodology or the approach you take is not just one particular perspective, which is the, the other way we use, use this, this term. It's the, the sociological imagination invites you to understand social issues from all of their aspects, to find out as much about it as you can, from the really crude, the, the one I introduced at the beginning, to, to the more elaborate. Now all of them will have a place, a resonance with some groups. What the sociological imagination gives you is the tools to be, in, to be able to uh, understand all of the dynamics that are feeding into a circumstance, present those and come to a much more sort of critically rational assessment of, of circumstances. Now when I use the word critical I don't mean you know you're an idiot critical. What I mean is the the intellectual rigorous approach that allows you to understand the situation from from a so I, I suppose a, a what the sci scientists would call a detached point of view so that that you're not being fed by any particular point of view you're looking at the situation um, and all of the dynamics involved so um, this was sort of built on a, on on the work of a bloke called C Wright Mills who developed this idea of the sociological imagination that the idea that we we're, we're um, engaging with the world in, in a, fuller, a fuller way that allows us to understand all of the dynamics. And then there's the idea of debunking, which is um, then allowing yourself to see all of these particular views and, 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 and address the ones that are most superficial, that aren't useful, that are maybe ill-informed or informed by, as I was saying in the beginning, sort of negative racist um, ethnic stereotypes for for instance so that the 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 broader your imagination your sociological imagination the greater your ability to be able to to debunk now this is the bob dylan bit so the other thing that you'll be doing um in this topic and, and, and becoming familiar with is 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 the history of sociology now this history <coughs> starts with what was called the Enlightenment, moves to modernity through industrialization and capitalism and then on to uh, where we are now which some may argue is, is postmodern, some may argue is sort of the, the digital age. Um, sociology began, okay so I'm, I'm talking about the Enlightenment here so let's put this away because it's a bit of a pain holding it. Um, Sociology uh, came out of this period called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment um, came around the, um, the 17th and 18th century and really what it, what it was was the, the procession of influence from the church to science if you like. Um, prior, to, prior to the Enlightenment the church was the most influential body um, in the European world uh, and I, I should, I should I suppose I should contextualise the sociology, the sociology that we're dealing with, the sort of the fundamental basic first year sociology is, is essentially a European study. There is African sociology, there is Asian sociology, there is Middle Eastern sociology. Um, what we're studying is, is an ethnocentric form of sociology which is European. Like with so many things, the, the West and the European view has dominated, 
has dominated the the world. We're we're starting to see now the sort of progression maybe from the west to the east. Um, so we're, over the next the course of our lifetimes, um, maybe not mine. Um, We'll see this, that we will possibly see this, this progression consolidated and then we may be studying things in, in, in quite a different context. So that's, that's sort of the important thing to understand. And the enlightenment and this development of, of knowledge has been, is a particularly European concept. There, have been, there has been a, uh, a long intellectual tradition through the Middle East that did actually feed into to Europe, but also a long intellectual tradition of, of the East that, that we don't deal with, we haven't dealt with, and it's, it's rich and it's long and it's complex like ours. Um, so having, having set that context, we can, we can sort of set that aside, but, but it's important that you understand that. So the Enlightenment came out of the, 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 the change of guard, if you like, from, from the church to science. And it really came about over a long history, starting with the Chaldeans, who were Middle Easterns, who developed mathematics, um, and mathematics was then turned into to, to science. The ancient Greeks used that to chart the cosmos, you know, the ancient Greek culture fell over and, and, and so that information went into decline. The Romans didn't take it up to any great degree because they liked to drink and a bit of a party and were very good with viaducts and toilets, um, but didn't develop the scientific knowledge um, uh, that the, the Greeks had um, until then the, the European church, which obviously was... Um, uh, founded in, in Rome, uh, because we're talking about the Catholic Church, um, then took up this knowledge and the church being the richest institutions with, with the, the intellectual um, capacities to translate from the Greek to, the, to Latin, uh, started to work on this scientific knowledge and this scientific knowledge ultimately, and it was about the cosmos working out whether the sun was at the centre of the universe or the earth was at the centre of the universe, the Greeks and the, the Roman church thought that earth should be at the centre because why would God or the gods um, make something in their form and image and stick it three planets out from the centre? They were wrong. And through this accumulation of knowledge deposited in, in Galileo, um, they finally worked out that in fact the sun, it was a heliocentric universe, the sun was at the centre, we were three planets out, my very excellent, yes, man. Um, that caused a great deal of problems for Galileo, who got locked in a room for the rest of his life uh, by the church and excommunicated. Um, but it also created a, a sort of an intellectual dissonance that, that uh, could only be dealt with by this progression from the church influencing knowledge to the scientific approach, which we think of as rational and free of any influence. So the idea that the church mediated how knowledge was constructed so that it could only be seen through the light of, of its already what it would consider established knowledge about God and how, how things worked had to, had to shift to a scientific point of view because science through mathematics proved that they were wrong. So that, that scientific, what they call the scientific revolution became sort of the fundamental intellectual foundation of the world we know today. And so that, that is where the power of science, where the notion of, of doctors, medical doctors, not proper doctors like me, um, that's to do with PhDs and all that sort of stuff, um, um, where doctors become gods, where, where we think of science as, as our saviour, our protector and the depositor of truth. This has sort of been subsequently challenged in recent times, but essentially the the scientific revolution took knowledge and turned it into something that was was beyond challenge, if you like, because science could prove things to be true or not true. And so that that evolved into this thing called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was, as it indicates, uh, a move away from sort of the the, the influence of, of 
the church and religion on knowledge and we, we became enlightened and we understood then science was the most important determiner of uh, truth and then what we call life chances in, in sociology. Uh, and sociology merged very early on. Sociology was one of those was one of those um, foundational subjects, if you like, or sciences um, that came out of the Enlightenment. Now, um, and it was 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 developed by a few blokes. They were all men, unfortunately. Um, well, not unfortunately, because they did a reasonable job, but you know what I mean. Um, the 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 bloke who sort of came before and who set up there, were, there was a bloke called called um, August Comte, and Comte was the one who who set up the idea that you could have a human science, a science that was able to 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 measure the social world, if you like, in a truly scientific way. Um, and the idea that you could have this enlightened science that was able to deal with society and the social and and we humans in that social world was was the foundations of where sociology began. It was really taken up and founded, if you like, by a, a French bloke called Emile Durkheim. And Durkheim uh, developed the idea from Comte of, of uh, a, science, a science of society where, where facts, social facts could be established, where the, the notion of, of social relationships was mediated by social facts and by, by society, and that we as members of this were subject to the influence of society and society constructed us in particular ways. They weren't interested in, in what, moved, what they described as what moved the human heart because they, they saw that that couldn't be measured. measured. What they were interested in was the dynamics of us, in the, us as, as humans in the context of the influence of the social world. Um, and this, th this movement, of this more general movement um, known as the Enlightenment, uh, became known as modernity and, and really modernity has flowed through till, till the present day. Um, and modernity is the idea of human progress, that, that the human intellect and the challenges of um, seeking after the truth through the, the best argument, the argument that had the force of, of facts behind it, um, was the, the key determinant of, of um, the good society. So, so the, the modernity, the Enlightenment project um, which some of them called it, deposited itself in modernity and we've had modernity ever since. So then um, Durkheim was followed by a bloke uh, called Karl Marx. Um, most of you will know Karl Marx, big beard, um, big hair, communism, socialism, all that sort of stuff. Um, um, probably, probably a bit misleading because communism really that we saw manifested was was more like totalitarianism um, but what so I'd set that stuff aside what we you want to think about Marx is that that Marx theorized about the the social world in the context of capitalism and and sort of economics more broadly and saw that we were we were subject to the influence of capitalism and economics um, and that that constrained the sort of choices we could make, so that, that it was a sort of a totalizing uh, theoretical approach that, that saw a subject to this. <coughs> Excuse me. Following just a, a bit late, because Marx, I think, died in 1883, um, Max Weber, uh, W-E-B-E-R, sort of like the barbecue, only without the extra B and pronounced with a V, Max Weber, um, uh, who died in 1920, so he was, he was a contemporary of Marx, but lasted a little longer and was a little bit younger, so he had the advantage of seeing Marx's theorising, also seeing Durkheim's theorising, and then Weber developed this, this notion that, um, yeah, the structures of society 
did bear down on us and did make us conform to, to the world in a particular way. Um, and some of those structures were, say, industrialization and capitalism. So I've got to do my bob again. Um, and we'll get on to, to this because I'm hinting at theories and perspectives now. Um, Weber, Weber also saw that it was possible for individuals and small groups to actually rise up and challenge the structure that causes us to be the way we are, that Durkheim saw that society moulded us into to particular moral sort of social subjects. Marx saw the, the economic and capitalist system um, actually oppressing us, for, except for a few of the, the very rich known as the bourgeoisie who had it all. Um, so Marx saw that the, the um, economy um, was the, the oppressive structure that, that made us conform to its needs. Weber acknowledged that these, these things were true and interestingly uh, developed a, a theory about bureaucracy that was prescient um, in that he, 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 he argued that capitalism couldn't go on without this supporting structure, which, which he called bureaucracy. Um, but he said the trap with bureaucracy is that it's going to then become an end in itself. And you get trapped in the iron cage of bu bureaucracy. Those of you who've ever been to Centrelink or de dealt with the taxation department will know exactly what Weber was meaning, that, that it's not about an outcome, it's about a process. And Weber argued that this process was going to lock up the benefits that, that capitalism could bring or the benefits that, uh, that uh, bureaucracy could bring in facilitating the, the capitalist processes. Um, but, but on the other side, he also argued that, that from the ground up, people could influence structures, that you could have social action that did change the way these structures worked. And the best example to finally bring women into the discussion is feminism, because feminism was one of those uh, small uh, core minority group movements that, that developed, flowered and then changed the way social structure works. So Weber was theorising along those, those lines. So out of all of this, um, we, we get in sociology theories and perspectives and these things inform how we see the world. So despite the fact that earlier on I've talked about the, the uh, sociological imagination or the gaze or the perspective telling us um, to, to look at everything. Um, once we've sort of looked at everything, got an idea of, uh, uh, about how the world works or one particular aspect of the world that we want to look at in research terms, we then inevitably, but not always, choose a theoretical approach to take. This is, this is a way of thinking about the world that helps us focus our research and understand what we want to find out. So if you're looking at what the banks are doing lately, you, you'd have to have, you, you couldn't just look at banks. It would be too big. So you need to take a perspective or a theory that, that targets particular aspects of, say, the banking system um, in order to, to start to tease it apart because it's very hard to do a research project on everything. So what a theory allows you to do is focus on, on um, a particular aspect um, to see what that theory brings to light about, say, the banking system. But you can have a number of theories looking at the banking system that have different perspectives about how things work. So you could take a Marxist view on the banks and say, well, it's all about power and oppression, and the banks really are, are only interested in looking at uh, the interests of their shareholders and management and the sort of the elite uh, financial institutions and the rest of us, what Marx would describe as the proletariat, suffer because of this. Um, you could take a Durkheimian perspective and you could say that the, that the banks uh, are a part of our social institutions and, and they're reinforcing social values. Um, and as, as social values change in, uh, in sort of Durkheim's perspective, we then slowly allow these changes to take place. So f for me, I can know about banking, say, in the 60s, and in, in the Durkheimian sense, you would say that the bank's role was to, to make us frugal and responsible and not outlandish in our, our 
consumption requirements. So the bank would only lend us a certain amount of money, would base their lending on a percentage of our income and wouldn't let us borrow above that. And in the, the context of the 50s and 60s, you had a much more, more frugal, if you like, less, less expansive attitude towards consumption and debt. Now that's evolved over the last 40 or 50 years um, to fit in with the new form of society that, that say somebody like Durkheim would, would acknowledge and so the values that are being asserted now are the values that, that reflect back on, on what society wants. So we've got much more consumption, much greater ease of borrowing, um, much more interest I suppose in being a shareholder because we all have superannuation. We've all bought the, the sort of the capitalist um, ideology of, of debt and consumption to, to fund our lifestyles. So there are different perspectives, different, theory, do what, different theories we use, they're sometimes called perspectives because um, generally a theory covers everything. Whereas in sociology we have different perspectives that we call theories um, that have competing views and this is the beauty of sociology, you can get parallel analysis and you can look over all of those different forms of analysis of, of different aspects of society and get the sociological imaginative view. So um, that then, then creates our research framework so that we can, we can understand the world in, in, in its various aspects. So the, the key thing I, I suppose I want to, to underline here is that, that what we're engaged in, what you're engaged in right here, right now, is a criti critical analysis of the social world. You don't take it for granted, you don't take it as it's seen. What you're doing is, is looking at w what all the factors are that may cause somebody to present a particular view about society. So if you think of of what you're reading in the media or what's being presented to you in the electronic media, um, not as the truth, but as, as a perspective. Why might they say that? What are the factors that may feed in to them having this view about the world? And not taking that view that's presented to you as given or based on, on some immutable truth, but somebody's particular perspective. And I suppose the, the, the key difference, if you, you, you think of the, the nightly news, is that you may see that the commercial news has a different perspective to the ABC. Now, one of the things you, you may say is the ABC has a different journalistic ethos. Um, you may look at the, the um, commercial media and, and say, well, these people are relying on money coming in from uh, sponsors and so their interests need to be to be taken into consideration. Uh, one of the interesting things for you to do to get sort of a bit of a view about how the the sociological imagination works and it's not necessarily sociology but it is media analysis and it is critical analysis is by watching Media Watch on Monday nights at 9.15 um, on Channel 2 on the television. Um, that will will start to unpack some of these stories you see in the news um, that we take as truth um, and in fact they're not truth at all and some of them in fact are lies. Now that's the starting, uh, what Media Watch does is the start of the process of developing what we call the sociological imagination. We probably take it a lot broader than they do um, but that's, that's maybe a good way of having a look at, at how those things work. The final thing I want to talk about is the structure agency debate because this is a fundamental in sociology. Um, what I've been talking about in terms of the theorists, particularly Durkheim and Marx, is that they, they argue that there's a structure. There's a, there's a solid social form that causes us to adhere to certain norms and values um, that to a certain extent keep us, keep us safe but but in another way make sure we act in a particular way. So if you think of the police and driving upon the road, there's, there's, a, there, there's a set of rules, there's a set of norms that inform you about how you should 
act and react in, in, in a driving situation. That's, that's a structure. We've, we've decided that we're going to drive on the left of the road here and that we have when two roads intersect a set of lights with signals that tell us what to do uh, and so that, that, that has us conform to, to uh, particular practices and that's underpinned by a set of values that we think that, that order in society is much better um, particularly in that context where the result could be death than, than well, chaos was probably how it would turn out, but that rather than giving individuals the right of choice when they get to an intersection, so you might get the biggest, the noisiest, the most abusive, being able to, to take advantage of that situation. So social structures are there for a particular reason and and in a lot of cases assist the, so the sort of fluid interaction of us with the world. Um, on the other hand, there's the notion of agency, and that is where we take it upon ourselves um, to act upon the world. So if you think of structure as the world acting upon us, agency is us acting upon the world. Uh, now, there are relative arguments about who has the most agency and, and the simple way of looking at it is, is sort of in a hierarchical sense the more power you have the more agency you have the more influence you can exert on the world and that's certainly true in, in sort of a crude sense but there are all sorts of agentic dynamics um, in, in say the context of a family um, um, and all right, if you've got a newborn baby that baby, without realising it, has an enormous amount of agency because that baby is going to get you out of the bed at two o'clock in the morning. Um, those sort of influences where we can have an influence on the world is the, the, the sort of fundamental dilemma um, in explaining how the social world works that, that sociology deals with. Is it structure? Is it, is it the, the, the overwhelming social forms that, that cause us to respond in a particular way that explains the world or is the influence of agency, is the influence of our individual sort of personalities and the individual dynamic relationship we have with the world um, the important factor in determining life chances. Um, so the structure agency, the difference between um, big society and small society if you like is, is one of the fundamental uh, issues that we deal with in the context of most sociology that we do. So that's that's where I'm going to end it today. That that sort of s hopefully sets sets things up for you. I'll in the the next lecture I'll I'll elaborate a bit on that and and then subsequent lectures will be um, consolidating that information in terms of the individual sort of components of society that that then demonstrate how these things work. So I'll see you next week. This has been a Swinburne production.